Welcome into the KSO Sunday show on a Monday. I'm Mason, both joined by KSU underscore fan Drew Galloway with us as well. As uh, we've all recovered from getting back from Colorado, or fan had a bunch of festivities yesterday, <laughs> and uh, everybody's Sunday was a whole lot better because K State actually won the game. So made everything a lot easier to uh, digest, no matter what you had going on. If you had to make it up to your family for spending all Saturday watching college football, a lot easier to do when the Cats win as opposed to feeling like you wasted a Saturday if they had lost, uh, probably like everybody did back with the BYU game. But we'll recap everything that went down with Colorado. A lot to get to there, especially because uh, I'm sure we all have thoughts on Colorado fans and the crow that they have to eat. That's going to be a fun time. And uh, then we've got plenty to get to in regards to the Big 12 and other stuff going on with K-State football and getting ready for West Virginia this weekend. If you're watching this, you probably realize I look like a goob because I forgot my microphone in the camera bag uh, that Drew has. So who knows when I'll get that back. May not be till next Wednesday at Big 12 Media Day for basketball. So uh, I'm going to look like a real gamer right now with my PlayStation headset on uh, for the next couple of days. It really may not impact any of you. Some of you would have just thought, what's he doing? Not a big deal. I told Fan and Drew, if it sounds like I talk funny, it's because I can't actually hear myself 100%. I got used to the radio lifestyle for the last eight years of my life where I can hear everything that I say as well as everybody else. So it's a little different, but uh, we'll be good to go. We'll keep the show moving and hope that I don't wake my daughter up. So let's uh, let's dive into this. Let's talk Cats, Colorado. And uh, I guess I'll start uh, by asking you, Drew, what you thought of the experience in Boulder and the crowd the environment and how K-State handled everything that was thrown their way figuratively and literally. Uh, experience wise, it was kind of the opposite of BYU. Like, I mean, you remember uh, that Sunday we kind of got back and when we were in the airport and then Dallas was talking about how everything really besides the game was awesome. Like it was really fun. Lots of nice people. Colorado, it was like everything besides the game was pretty terrible. Like the, the stadium was just okay. The fans were a mess, but they, they, they were a mess all week. Uh, but environment-wise, it, it got loud at times. It probably wasn't as consistently loud as even K-State is. Definitely not how consistently loud that BYU was. Uh, but there, there was times where it did get pretty loud, and it was pretty loud up until that on that last drive that K-State had. But I think that K-State handled it really well, and you could really see them handling it well. And kind of, for the most part, for the second half, kind of took the crowd out of the game on that eight-minute drive uh, where Taquan Roberson came in. And then the crowd was pretty quiet up until the last few offensive drives that K-State had, and then obviously the interception got a pretty good loud pop from the crowd. And then Colorado took the lead. Uh, but then, again, the crowd went pretty silent again until they started throwing crap on the field after uh, K-State was taking knees. That sounds like par for the course. Yeah, probably par for the course from what I've heard. Yeah, I uh, it was it was an interesting experience there, seeing what everything uh was like and and how things came about honestly i to me i i kind of expected um uh, i thought that the the prime fan nature of colorado would be restricted mostly to just the internet and social media i did not expect it to be a thing that while we were there in person you encountered so many people that we're seemingly really only there for Deion Sanders. Uh, I mean, we checked into the hotel and DY came up and told us that he was spending some time down in the lobby when we got there and was like, yeah, I talked to like two different groups of people that were there and they were there for the game. But the reasons that they gave that they were there, it was like somebody from California and somebody from Wyoming. I think he said that they were there because of Deion Sanders. It had nothing to do with Colorado. And then you walk into the stadium and I don't know, at least 50% of all of the the gear that you saw people wearing didn't have the CU logo on it. It was all just prime branding, whether it was his hoodies and sweatshirts or like personalized prime jerseys or something. It's, it's kind of uh, an odd, an odd deal. And I think that's what leads to 
like the the environment that Drew's talking to, there are a lot of people that are still there that obviously like they've been with Colorado their whole lives. Like Colorado football is important to them. But you also have a mixture there that just like Deion Sanders himself, Deion's not there for Colorado. He's there for himself. And those people are there for Deion. And I don't know that you're going to generate the the kind of environment you want if somebody's only there for one person as opposed to like the school actually means something to you. Oh, it was also just different in the sense that the the first person we saw when we walked in the stadium was CC Sabathia. I mean, that's not something that you get a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, the 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 first person being a celebrity, and then uh, you know the the person taking like stuff at the media table was wearing a eight ain't hard to find shirt. So it's like, oh, okay, you, you're working for the <laughs> university, but you're wearing a shirt that uh, doesn't have a buffalo on it interesting uh but k-state handled it well for the most part they came out didn't score on the first drive they gave up the touchdown but then they bounced back came back and were able to score and really you know colorado got the benefit of the field position there because k-state was way backed up mcclannon had a not so great punt and uh only half the field to work with colorado was able to kind of execute it and go from there so in terms of what you actually saw from the game fan what did you think of the first half that K-State showed and then the second half they showed. Because really, in the first half, it was low possession. What, only four possessions maybe for K-State. They scored on two of them. Uh, they were up 14-7. to seven. It felt like they were in control of the game at halftime. They kind of proved that when they came right back out for the second half. But then obviously, some more things spiraled from there and made it a little bit more uh, difficult to judge what the Wildcats did. Yeah, it, it really came down to... Um in a lot of ways, the, the two things I got clipped for on Twitter last week that uh, saying that Colorado had a terrible running game and a not so good run defense. And I think both of those proved to be true. And uh, I did think K-State controlled the game once they got the offense going, once they figure out how well they could run the, the ball. Cause it was interesting. The first, the first carry for DJ was one of those outside power toss plays where they pull the play side guard and center, I think off tackle and it went for no gain. And then after that, I don't know if they figured it out or if they thought it would work, but then it became the inside zone inside power show. And uh, K-State ran it from different formations in a couple different ways. And once they got that going for about two and a half quarters, Colorado had no answer to stop them. And really, in some ways, K-State really only stopped themselves a couple times down that stretch. And and I thought it was really just figuring out that they could run the ball. Um, they could get blockers to the second level and block uh, Colorado's linebackers. And really, once they got to the second level, they could make uh, Shiloh Sanders miss and DJ could get another five to 10 yards uh, on probably six to seven carries. So, uh, they figured that out. They got enough going in the passing game. Uh, that came more in the second half. It was another game where K-State really struggled to throw the ball in the first half and then found the passing game in the second half and found big plays in the passing game in the second half, which is really the key uh, to getting that thing going. Um, so so that was, that was one side of it. I thought the K-State defense in the first half played really good football to hold Colorado to seven points. I thought the second half they struggled. Um, the funny thing was, I, I, you know, you always think that if a team loses one or two of their best wide receivers, that should mean it's easier to defend them. But I was talking with some people today. Um, I think sometimes that makes it almost more difficult because you have a game plan to stop Travis Hunter and even to stop their second best receiver as keys. And on the other side of the ball, Shiloh Sanders probably catches himself whether he wants to or not looking for Travis Hunter on a lot of pass plays. And then all of a sudden it's opened up and you're looking at the whole field. And as much as I want to put down Colorado at times, Sanders is a really, really good player. Shadur Sanders is a really good quarterback. And they had some really good pass schemes to get guys open. And they had some good pass schemes to beat K-State's blitzes, which um, did not often get home. 
when they needed to. And when they didn't get home, Colorado torched K-State. So um, that combination um, led it to become a hairy f- football game in the fourth quarter when K-State, I thought, really controlled the game for two-thirds of the game, probably two and a half, two, almost three quarters. And then, um, you know, after the three and out following K-State's interception, then Colorado came to life and then it became uh, K-State hold, held on for dear life. And I would throw a couple of other things out there to, to go off of that. I mean, I, I, I saw Colorado fans that their reaction to the game, I think the rational and the sane ones, um, they were talking about certain things that they thought Colorado could have done or should have been doing all season. And O'Marion Miller is one of the guys that I saw a lot of Colorado people commenting, like, that's a perfect example. He should have been out there all along. And you look, I mean, he's only a true sophomore uh, and he didn't have much going for him until he entered that game, but he was a four-star recruit and was one of these high end guys that Dion was able to get to come to Colorado. And obviously he showed that he could make a play. Another thing that I would point out too is that for the most part, like Colorado put the ball in the air a lot of times. And while yes, 34 or 40, you would like to not allow that many completions. Um, if you go and look at Colorado, I, I was looking through this for player grades today because I was interested by it because Colorado had the one big pass play where they went for 50 yards or 51, mm-hmm. whatever it was. And I was like, okay, what w- what was everything else like? Because this is an explosive team. They've got playmakers. They're going to try and use the pass to get the ball down the field. And obviously, Shadur is really good. K-State, everything else big play-wise was limited to 25 yards and less. There's only been one other game this year where there's only been one play over 25 yards for Colorado's offense. And that was actually the Colorado state game. Crazy enough where Colorado dominated, they won 28 to nine, but they only scored 28 points. So as much as we, you know, you know like to give Jay Norvell and the, whatever party he's running over there, some crap, um, they probably had a pretty solid defensive game plan for Colorado. They just were too pathetic on offense to actually be able to score against Colorado um, probably use that million dollar quarterback or whatever too much in that game should have been given it to the running back. But to me, that is something to keep in mind with how K-State's defense played and Shadur Sanders. Like I, some people I, I think didn't like when I was trying to explain some of the secondary stuff. And I used Chris Kleiman's words of, he called Shadur Sanders the best quarterback in the country on Saturday night after the game. And some people were kind of pushing back against that. I think where that comes from is you look at Shadur and you see, okay, he holds on to the ball way too long. There's no way the best quarterback in the country makes that decision and makes massive plays that detrimental without the ball leaving his hand. Like there are some quarterbacks that have all the talent in the world, but they'll throw the picks, you know, that's not Shadur. I would put him in the category of he's probably the best thrower of the football in the country with everything combining accuracy and how far he can get the ball down the field. And that would be the thing that gave K-State some fits at times. And again, to point this out, 21 of Colorado's 28 points came after all of those guys got hurt. You know, that those last 21 points they scored started on the drive where guys dropped like flies. So things changed drastically in this game for both sides. And at the end of the day, I mean, uh, Travis Hunter is obviously a phenomenal player, probably the best if, or second best player in college football with Ashton Genty. But I would argue that it was an equal playing field in terms of what happened in the game because of injuries. K-State, obviously, the, their secondary is in much worse shape than the passing game for Colorado because Colorado still has a top five, top 10 pick at quarterback getting to pick on. Zayshon Rich, who's a true freshman that's never played corner in a game at K-State against Daniel Cobbs, who has limited snaps this season as a JUCO transfer last year. Um, And then a number of other guys trying to make up for significant injuries to K-State's probably legitimately their four best defensive backs going into the game yesterday, because I think Justice James would be included in that category based on the way that he's played uh, this season. So I think... You consider all that, and then you look at K-State offensively, where we talked going into this, run game was obviously important. Fan was all over that. DJ Giddens had a great night running the football, but the quarterback run game was important too. The three quarterbacks that Colorado had faced that had any juice whatsoever in their legs had run for 81, 82, and 77 yards. And Avery Johnson, 
ends up having an injury that prevents him from being able to run. Like Chris Kleiman said it after the game, quarterback run was not something that they could use. It was not on the table. So he was relegated to becoming a pocket passer in the second half. And that changed what K-State's offense could be. For the most part, I think Avery Johnson handled it very well. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that's a lot to take into consideration here. A couple of the historic notes I mentioned that for this season, that's only the second time that Colorado has been held to only one pass play over 25 yards, really only one play. I don't think they have a run that's gone more than like 10 yards. Uh, the defense came away with six sacks and then the least rushing yards in Colorado football history uh, at negative 29. So a pretty big day for K-State's defense, despite the fact that the secondary had some lapses, some of the tackling at times. I, the, the Colorado receivers just kind of made dudes look silly. There'd be three K staters right there in front of them. And somehow just a couple of little spins and boom, they're by it for a couple of extra yards. Uh, but for the most part, I actually think the K state defense probably deserves some praise because they did enough in this game. And that's something that over the last two seasons, you couldn't easily say last year, there were a lot of times where we would say the offense probably made the most mistakes but the defense, they they have some fault here too. Think of the Oklahoma State game. Chris Kleiman immediately was like, yeah, but the defense didn't force any turnovers. They let him get down into field goal range basically every single drive. They could have been better there. That, that's kind of been the theme over the course of these losses for K-State is that, yep, offense came up short, but the defense – don't let them out of this free. The defense did their job uh, on Saturday night, and K-State's offense, I think, again, like the two-lane game, proved that this year's team has the ability to win these games that I don't think last year's team does. Yeah, the other thing that I was going to add that kind of piggybacks off of your point of Colorado is probably better off with the injuries that they had than K-State because K-State's playing inexperienced guys. Will Shepard is the number four receiver for Colorado. He was a 2,000-yard career player at Vanderbilt playing in the SEC mm-hmm. and that's their receiver for K-State's <laughs> corner four that was thrust into action was Zayshon Rich who hadn't played a snap at corner all season so you kind of miss me with all this okay Travis Hunter wasn't in well neither was K-State's three best defensive backs so you, your your receiver four was a 2,000 yard receiver uh, in four years at, at Vanderbilt Yeah, and I tell you what, 680 and 770 yard seasons at Vanderbilt uh, might be more impressive than doing (laughs) a thousand yards anywhere else. I mean, because that's pre Pavia Vanderbilt. Uh, That's uh, that's notable for Will Shepard and a good point there. Like Colorado, there's no doubt they have an abundance of weapons when it comes to the passing game, but their shortcomings end up coming from the fact that that offensive line still is not very good uh, and they don't have a run game whatsoever and i'll ask you this fan were you surprised with how run heavy colorado's offense decided to be in the first half of that game it it blew me away how how many times we saw a running back touch the ball for colorado because jadur sanders probably should have thrown the ball at least 50 times in this game for how bad the running game was yeah i you know i i I wasn't that surprised because i think (laughs) coaches can be stubborn offensive coordinators can be stubborn you had a couple of games where they kind of ran the ball okay. And I think you go into the game thinking, well, we got to try to run it a little bit to, to keep K-State off balance. Plus, you know, they they mentioned, you guys probably didn't see it, but they mentioned early in the telecast that, that Colorado's offensive coordinator had mentioned to, to one of the play-by-play guys that K-State often plays with a short box with only five in the box. And so I think they thought, well, we have to try to run it if K State's going to do that. And you know, I, to go to that point, K, Colorado's running backs ran the ball ten times for twenty-two yards, uh, and I think their longest rush was four yards for a running back during the game. They did have the one short touchdown, um, but uh, th- there just was no success for that running game against K State's defense. And in K State's rush defense is one of the best in the country and maybe the best in the Big 12. So uh, that has been a, a Klanderman and a Kleiman thing. Like, we are going to stop the run, and then hopefully we can stop the pass enough to win ball games. And, uh, you know, Shadur Sanders almost made them pay for that mindset. But uh, they, in the end of the day, they didn't because the, uh, the, the 
the first half, Colorado still threw the ball 66% of the time, so it's still two-thirds of the time. The second half, they threw the ball 87% of the time. So uh, it, that's a crazy ratio when you think about it. But, you know, when it came down to it, you know, K-State had to stop the pass to win the game, and they did um, on that last drive. So uh, give them credit. And, again, give them credit for sticking to their guns of we're not going to let you run the ball on us, and they didn't. Uh, to kind of back up your rusty stuff for K-State, if you go and look at the the Big 12 leaders, uh, K-State leads the Big 12 in rushing yards allowed per game at only 71.7. Uh, but then, obviously, you want to go and make sure that you can see how the average looks. Uh, teams are averaging two and a half yards a carry against K-State. That is 0 0.7 yards better on average than Arizona State and UCF, who are two and three and run defense. Now it should be noted that the team that's fourth on that list is West Virginia, who K-State will see this week and they're average they're only giving up 3.6 yards a touch. So it'll be interesting to see how DJ Giddens performs against them because Oklahoma State is dead last against the run. Colorado, uh they're in the the second half of the leaderboard in terms of stopping the run. So back to back weeks, you've gotten to see two of the worst teams in the Big 12 against the run. Now you're going to get to see a team close to the echelon that your own defense uh, is in. Well, let's talk about quarterback play because obviously Avery Johnson, we're always going to talk about him, but Taquan Roberson also played in the game. And I gave the the quarterbacks a little bit of a boost on the, the player grades this week because of what Taquan Roberson did, because he came in and think back to a crucial game in 2022 where Will Howard came in and he was, he was game for it. He was going to be ready to, to lead K-State to a big win over TCU that they needed. But then he gets hurt, and the game gets turned over in a much more comparable situation because obviously Will ended up being the starter the rest of the season, and he's a more than capable quarterback from his junior season on. But Jake Rubley had to come in for him, and that's when K-State gave the game away. They had the lead when Jake Rubley came into the game, and by the time Will Howard got back into the game, that thing was basically over, and TCU had shot past them. And on the road, in a crucial drive, Taquan Roberson was able to go down the field after Avery Johnson hit a big play to Jace Brown, leaves, doesn't miss a beat, made a really big throw to Jace Brown, did a couple of other really nice things, and eventually – I mean, he. I think he would have been able to finish off the touchdown drive, but Avery came back and was able to throw the little pass to Brown for the touchdown. Uh, how important was Taquan Roberson in this game, Drew? Yeah, k doesn't win the game without Taquan Roberson. Uh, like, that drive easily could have just ended in a field goal, and k kind of goes out with a whimper. It, and when it was that third and long situation where they had to throw to Jace Brown, you kind of had that feeling that, okay, this is probably you settle for a field goal and instead of going up 21 to seven and taking more time off the clock, you're going up 17 to seven and you're kind of worried about what the rest of the game looks like. Uh, but Roberson comes in, throws three great balls on the three, the three passes that he threw one just happened to be dropped and, and the offense didn't really miss a beat. And, and like you said, even if Avery Johnson doesn't come back in during that drive, I think Casey still probably scores. So it, it's crucial when you have a backup, and that's why K State went out and got a backup that had experience playing at the power four level and had experience as, as a starter at the group of five level, uh, or I guess independent because you've got UConn's independent now. Very weird. Uh, <laughs> but he, he had experience starting at a, at a lower level. So you go out and get those kind of guys because if you need somebody to come in and play, you want somebody that has a game experience and to have that and to get that out of the transfer portal. I said way back in, I think it was May when Roberson committed, that that was one of the biggest wins of the, the entire recruiting cycle for K state because they needed somebody that had experience just in case this happened. And that really played out in Boulder on Saturday night. Yeah. I, I was very impressed. I agree with what both of you said about, Take one Robeson really being a key player in that game, even though he played, you know, six or seven, eight snaps on that drive. But the key is, you know, he helped that drive keep going to get a touchdown. But but you're right. I mean, he, here's a guy that was good enough to go to Penn State, start his career, played at UConn last year and threw the ball 
30 times a game at UConn for the course of 10 or 11 games. So a guy that's seen a lot of defenses, played at Tennessee, played at Boston College, games at those places, played Duke. Uh, so he he played some high-level competition uh, as a UConn quarterback, even though the team was terrible. You still get a guy with experience. So, I, you know, I think – it would be interesting. It'll be interesting to see the the tactic teams take in the portal. With will you go find a good quarterback from a bad team from a G five or even low P four P four level that just wants to be part of a winner that wants to get out of a bad situation and end his career on a high note. And as much as quarterbacks get hurt in college football, it's a key place and a key thing to have. And in K State, you know, even though. They were already down to their second quarterback two years ago. We saw the results of that at TCU uh, in 2022. And what happens when you don't have that guy that can come in and give you snaps and and be a reliable backup? So um, really big for him to come in and make some really good throws. That that third down throw to Jace Brown to pick up the first down uh, was, was one of the plays of the game that really helped K-State build that 21-7 lead. Uh, which was just a big moment in the game and made a big difference in that game. I think more, more impressive than even just the fact that he executed, it was how he executed because he came in. And I thought Avery Johnson was better about this with his passing against Colorado, mm-hmm. said it was more decisive. Taquan Roberson had no fear. He get, went in there and he knew the second he had something, he was going to do it. Uh, I think that's important. And I think that probably – is going to be the, the blueprint moving forward that if you're a team that feels uneasy about your backup quarterback situation and you have the the situation that K-State does where you're looking around and saying, we're probably going to be a pretty good team. We're, we're going to be attractive to somebody like a Taquan Roberson um, to that G5 level because really UConn is a G5 program, if we're being honest here. Um, and he was able to come in. He's got all that experience, so it's not like he's going to be afraid of the moment. And he's a dude that, in his career, I went back and looked. Uh, he put the ball in the air 40 times in a game in Neyland Stadium with UConn, and then he had uh, a game in 2021 when he was still at Penn State where he put the ball in the air 21 times at Kinnick Stadium. So he had experience against some really good teams and really tough environments over the last couple of years of his career, and I'm sure that was able to translate, and uh, he had no fear, and he played really well uh, for K-State on Saturday night and was uh, crucial in the victory, and obviously Chris Kleiman shouted that out at uh, shouted that out as well. Okay, a couple of other things. Let's talk about the defense. We mentioned some of the notes on it earlier. Um, long-term concern with the defensive back situation, taking injury out of it, but just based on what you saw on Saturday, where is the concern level moving forward? Or you know, did they impress you in some way? Because I think some people would be surprised to hear that, but I guess there's a world in which uh, they, they performed a little bit better than you anticipated. So, Drew, I'll, I'll let you start, and then Fan can follow up. See, this, this is tough because if we're taking injuries out of it, I think that you have to say that you were at least pretty impressed because without K-State's defensive backs just dropping like flies – Colorado had only scored seven points at that point. And and it wasn't always pretty, but at the end of the day, you can have a thousand yards in a game, but if you're either not scoring or you're kicking field goals, does it really matter? Like you would like them to get off the field more, but Colorado wasn't scoring on the drives that they were having success on. So I I think that that's just going to be what it's going to have to be this season is okay you're gonna allow yards you're gonna allow catches but are, is it catch tackle is it or is it catch broken tackle and then you're off to the races and scoring and for the most part on saturday it was catch tackle or it was sack and or another sack and you're pushing the other team back and then you get off the field and i think that i'd rather i'd rather it just be complete dominance but i don't think that we're going to get that this year so if you can get a game where you're just catching and tackling or you're making a big play to get a stop later on in the drive or the other team is kicking field goals, I think that it's fine. Yeah, I think another part of it is is this staff still figuring out the best way to attack offenses with what we have. 
And I think we saw that chess match um, in that game as it unfolded in um, were they going to try to bring extra people in blitz? Were they going to play three down and play eight in coverage? Were they going to try to play four down at times, which seemed at times to be the most successful approach is playing four down um, with the, with an extra kind of edge defender or edge rusher on the field and in, in those situations. So that seemed to be at play um, because, because against a guy like Sanders, if you send two or three extra guys for pressure and you don't get home, he showed he's going to find that open guy and, you know, you can try to cover up behind and you can hope you're, you've got sound enough coverage to, to make up for a guy running free, but you just can't, rely on that to be successful very often or for uh, if the quarterback isn't going to make a major mistake, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Um, so, so I think that's part of it. I, I do think once you took out K-State's experienced secondary guys and had to insert one or two guys that hadn't played much, that does expose a lot more issues. And I think we saw that. And I think it's fair um, I don't think it's an excuse to to put that as part of the blame, as you know you talked about earlier. Guys on the field that really hadn't played at all this year, that you're counting on uh, being thrown out on the on the the field in the in a tough situation. So, you know, if, if K State's going to devote themselves to stopping the run, and we're going to make you beat us through the air, then you've got to find more ways to get off the field in those tough situations. But then again, part of that is the personnel issues that they dealt with with injuries during that game. So it'll be interesting to see. And every game's different. I mean, we're going to see a much different type of offense at West Virginia than we saw in Colorado. So that'll be another different type of test. Yeah. Fan, I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask a fan a question. Uh, you've watched a lot of football. Have you ever seen a K State team run a four down with one linebacker before Saturday I, night? No, not very often. I, I'm sure there's been a few times. I don't. I doubt it ever happened under Schneider. If it happened, it probably happened under Kleiman because he's more of an outside the box type of thinker, and Klanderman is as well. Um, but I think that was a good move, uh, given that Colorado was not going to try to run the ball at all on you eventually. Uh, Fan, you and Chris Nelson talked about this a little bit during the game in a group chat that we have, and it was kind of going back and forth about K-State switching up when mm-hmm. they just kind of stayed with their, their, I guess, kind of their base front for what they chose to do during this game, and then also when they tried to blitz and send some extra guys, and it seemed like Colorado had more success against the blitz. From, from your point of view, what do you think that was about and, and just kind of what you saw uh, from when Colorado did and did not have success in the first half? Because obviously the second half, they had a lot of success, but as we talked about, that probably has a lot more to do uh, with the the situation at, at corner and and safety. Well, I, I think it I think it goes down to, you know, even though Shadur Sanders is not going to try to take off and run with the football and and try to make plays with his feet scrambling, he is going to move in the pocket. And I think that's why you see him take some of those ridiculous sacks because he's willing to spin and try to drop back further to make a play with his arm. And if he can get his feet set, he's probably going to find somebody. I think we saw him do that when he could elude that pressure and Colorado could pick up a blitz. um, One of those two things happening. Um, so, So I think a four man rush an odd, an even rush, gives you more options, gives you that extra guy to keep him in the pocket and not let him flush and still have enough guys in coverage with seven behind, um, even if one of those or two of those are linebackers, you can cover those guys a little bit better. Um, so when you when you end up sending three down linemen and then rushing two more guys, three more guys, and bringing five or six, if he makes one of those guys miss, and is able to step up or step outside the pocket, he's going to find someone open. I think that's really the story of that game. And and I think, you know, I think Nelly really nailed it. When K-State played four down, they were having much more success stopping Colorado than when they played three down in coverage or they played three down and tried to bring extra guys. 
Okay. Uh, before we wrap up shop on talking Colorado, we've got a couple of fan questions to get to from the thread that I posted earlier today. And then we'll talk, uh, you guys can have a moment to speak to the Colorado fans if you would like to. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll start real quick here though, by talking about the officiating questions in the game, because obviously Colorado people wanted pass interference called on that last play. Um, at the end of the day, the way that I saw it was, Keenan Garber did a pretty good job of trying to turn around, make a play. And yes, he had an arm that was kind of towards the back of the Colorado receiver, but I think it was light. I don't think it had any impact on the play. And I think I said this to Drew immediately after the game, but I just kind of thought, you know, if the Colorado receiver doesn't kind of rake his hands down and pull Keenan Garber's head and body down, he maybe does get the pass interference call, but to some extent he was just as culpable in trying to pull Garber down. And I think the other notable thing too, is if you watch the replay, whether whatever angle you get, the ball isn't really close to either of them. You know, you would think if you're wanting a legit PI possibility, that ball might hit one of those guys or you'll see it fly past them in the shot. You really don't see that. So I don't think that was a significant deal. The other thing that I'll note, Avery got called for an intentional grounding penalty earlier in the game that I would not deny is intentional grounding. But I know at one point later in the game, I think it was when Colorado was moving pretty deep in in the red zone, the refs announced that it wasn't intentional grounding because Shadur Sanders got hit during the play and that affected his arm, which I didn't think anything of in the moment until watching the game back today and seeing the play that they threw the flag on for Avery after discussing it. Avery was rolling out to his right. He got hit and DJ Giddens was within at least 10 feet of the ball. Like there, Mm -hmm. you could have legitimately argued there. Hey, I was trying to throw to my running back. I got hit as, as I was going, it knocked the ball off course. I found that very fascinating. And I would also note that after the game, while we were waiting on uh, Chris Kleiman and players to come out, the refs walked by where the, the visiting media was waiting. Uh, and I, I, there were kind of some jokes cracked and most of the refs took it pretty well. The white hat was, was fine. Like most of them laughed. Somebody asked a question though, as they were walking by and the last ref, I don't know. I don't know what role he had in the game. He was not about it. He was all serious. <laughs> he apparently took great offense to it. Oh, I think it was the, the ESPN camera guy in there that was like, was, was that PI at the end? He's like, I don't know. Did you see, did you see a flag on the play? And I was like, okay, dude, like, like at this point, everybody else is joking, having a good time. Like you don't have to be such a hard ass about this. Um, so those are just my, my officiating takeaways from this game. Do either of you have any thoughts on those plays or anything else on how the game was officiated? Cause I know other people have noted uh, Toby Asensami probably could have gotten a sack in the game, uh, if not for being held a couple of times. Um, I think you could look back and say if K-State was that disruptive throughout the game, there were probably a handful of times where holding was not called and it probably should have been. Uh, you don't get any sympathy for me for wanting pass interference when it's fourth and five and you throw it 45 yards. <laughs> throw it to the sticks and you will you could hear me argue more. But when you're throwing a 50-50 ball 45 yards down the field on fourth and five, I don't really care. And I'm kind of with you. I did. I think I learned less about what pass interference or what a intentional grounding was on Saturday than I probably ever had because of the six Shadur Sanders incompletions, one was the interception and then two others were probably plays that I was like, huh, why isn't that intentional grounding? But Avery's was. So I, I don't know. It, intentional grounding doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But the pass interference, whatever, get crimey or ever, don't throw it 45 yards on fourth and five. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that take. And then I, you know, I think Mason nailed it. If, if both players are being pretty physical with each other and no player is really gaining an advantage, um, they're probably going to no call it in a college football game, I think, most of the time, especially in that situation. Um, both, you know, I think as Mason said, both guys were pushing and shoving and trying to get an advantage and neither one got an advantage. And, and frankly, it wasn't a very catchable ball. So those all go factor into that. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, uh, to get to the fan questions that were submitted, I'm going to break these up, and we can go pretty quickly with them. I'm going to give two to fan, two to Drew, and then you'll both get to answer the last question here. So the two for fan, the first one, I combined them. Are DJ Giddens and Brendan Mott the best at their position in the Big 12? Um, I, I think DJ Giddens probably is the best running back in the Big 12, given the combination – of, of skill set he has. Um, his vision is ex- exemplary. He's really good at making people miss, and he can run through tackles and get yards after contact. Um, biggest weakness is in that open field. He doesn't have quite the breakaway speed to run away from people, although he did run away from people against Oklahoma State on the one run. So we've seen that a little bit. And, I, you know, you know it's actually – Talk to Scott Wildcat about this today uh, in a chat. He's being hurt a little bit because he doesn't score. Yeah. K-State doesn't get him touchdowns yep. in the red zone, and all these other guys are scoring more than him when you look at a Taj Brooks or a Harvey from UCF. Cam Scadaboo is – I mean, Cam Scadaboo won player of the week this he week won, because he did find the end zone. He won solely because he scored. There's no way his effort – was better than DJ Giddens' effort on Saturday. I just can't – I watched much of that game. I mean, he did a fine job. He's a really good yeah. player, and I'm not saying that at all. But DJ Giddens' performance was much more impressive than his. So yeah. um, I, that one for sure. Brendan Mott is up there. I mean, there's a lot of pretty good defensive linemen in this league, but Brendan Mott is is really – I. You know, I thought he'd be a good player for K-State. I thought he would be our best defensive lineman. But he's playing at an elite level and and playing at an all-Big 12 level. And even though he's got to be the focus on everybody's scouting report on who to block, he's still making plays on a regular basis to cause havoc. Uh, What would you give Avery Johnson as a grade for the game against Colorado? Obviously, he dealt with, you know, some – some injury uh, that went into the game. And then also uh, he was able to make some really big throws. And I, I, I said, I think it's, even though he threw for more yards against Oklahoma state, I think that was his best passing game of the season, considering the throws that he made and how it looked. And then you factor in the fact that he had an injury in, you know, the midsection of his body, which it's a pretty impactful spot. If you're trying to throw a football, I would think. Uh, so what grade would you give Avery Johnson here? I, I mean, I, I think, probably a B plus, you know, we saw him miss some throws. He missed one time when he got sacked, he missed Will Swanson. I think even on that interception, he probably could have thrown it to one of the outside two guys. Cause there was a trips formation. He kind of targeted Jace Brown. I think he could have thrown it to one of the outside two guys. He missed when Will Swanson was uncovered a player two before that interception um, where they didn't even have Colorado didn't even have covered. Uh, but the throw to Jace Brown at the end was a spectacular throw. Um, even the little wheel route to DJ Giddens to get him out of uh, deep in the territory. He made some other nice throws to Jace Brown um, on some other drives and really played a great second half. He stepped up when he needed to step up. And like you said, he stepped up when everybody knew, including himself, that he wasn't going to be able to run the football and yeah. still was able to make plays with his arm, which is kind of the next step of his progression to be, that elite quarterback that all of us at K-State expect him to be. And I think he took a step in that direction in that second half against Colorado. Yeah, Drew and I both agreed after the game because we both were going to reference it in the instant reaction. The tweet from Shan J. Raja from CBS Sports I thought was probably the best of the night on him where he basically said, and this was even before I think that last drive that Avery had. It was on the drive previously before the interception happened where you know, you, you see throws like that from Avery Johnson, you go, wow. And you just have to think that down the road, like that's going to become a consistent thing. It's not just a, he makes that throw every once in a while right now. We're talking a year from now. Those are the throws he's making on a regular basis. And then combine that with his legs. That's a scary thought for people that won't be wearing purple. Um, Drew, the questions for you will stick with the grading theme. Halfway through the regular season, what grade would you give Connor Riley for how he's performed as offensive coordinator with the play calling? Because we've talked about him a lot this season, um, but the offense seems to be finding itself right now. I mean, I, I would say probably B plus, A minus range. I know that the passing game was probably slow 
er than most wanted to come around, but it, it it's looked a lot better in the last two games. The BYU game was kind of a clunker just for everybody. And I think that he still did some good things in that BYU game calling the plays. It's just he had to deal with a lot of penalties and then had some issues in the red zone there. But I, I would like to see probably a little bit more creativity, probably – a better killer instinct because I think that K State really missed that killer instinct against Colorado, but it didn't it didn't end up hurting them. Uh, but then you see the good things like you knew that that little wheel route to DJ, they call it in the third quarter, DJ drops it, and then they call it again, and it's still wide open. So, so you get that, and you get a lot of the good. You get some kind of clunkiness, but I think that overall he's been really solid. K-State's one of the best offenses this year in points per drive in the Big 12, and I think that he's doing about as good of a job as you would want him to do as a first-time play caller to be in that upper four or five teams in the Big 12 in points per drive. Uh, another Avery question for you to close it out. Does Avery average over or under two and? 207 and a half passing yards per game the rest of the year. So you look at what he's been able to kind of go out and accomplish uh, to this point in time. He's, he's played pretty well the last couple of games when we talk about throwing the football. Um, where do you think that he ends up by the end of the season with his passing yards per game? What pace do you expect him to continue to be on? I think that he'll be over that 207. I think that there are some favorable matchups coming up for K-State starting with this week, really. Uh, throwing the ball, West Virginia not very good defending the pass, and that believe it or not, they're actually worse at stopping the pass and at the explosive pass specifically than K State is. So there's some opportunities for a lot of yards there. And then I mean, Houston is pretty decent at pass defense. Arizona State's decent. So you look at the the schedule coming up, and even KU has been just okay to stopping the pass. You're seeing the timing looks better the rapport with the receivers looks better that, that I think that you'll get that over 207. And I, I would almost venture to say that he will kind of shatter that 207 number. Okay. Uh, this question is for both of you and Rambo 21 posed it. If you could add any K state defender in history for the rest of the year to the team, who would it be? And then the same question for offense. So a uh, fan, I'll let you throw out some guys from, the eighties or, uh, you know, the, the one good player from teams that went Oh nine and one at K state. Um, wow. That's a great question. I, I would probably go with another elite defensive end like Darren Howard that, uh, to get that pressure that K state needs, I think on the quarterback, I'd love to see a guy like that. Another elite safety, like Jamie Mendez, Going back to early 90s, mid 90s, K Staters, early Snyder, K State player that was a really good safety. So, someone like that, um, that would, would just be an elite presence. And then, you know, I got to go with my guy, Ty Zimmerman, as, as <laughs> maybe one of the best and maybe one of the more under, under heralded safeties in K State history, even though he just made plays his whole career. I was about to give you credit for not being a homer and, and going with Ty Zimmerman, and then you you said, well, I'm going to give you three defensive guys that maybe uh, – if you had to pick just one of those, is, is Darren Howard the Darren answer? Howard, yeah. yeah. The, the elite pass rusher would be pretty big for this this team. Offensively, where would you go? I don't, I don't think this team needs a quarterback. I don't think they need a running back. Uh, so I think really the only options are probably offensive line or wide receiver, but I'm interested to see who you would pick. I would probably pick Tyler Lockett just because I think he was so good. Um, maybe an elite big time, big receiver like Quincy or Quincy Howard, not Quincy Morgan. Quincy Morgan, yeah. um, Quincy Morgan, just big time, big playmaker, a bigger receiver. This team really doesn't have a great big receiver. Be nice to have someone like that. Drew, you can give us the Snyder 2.0 answer. <laughs> Maybe that's how uh, we do it. Fan gave us Snyder 1.0, guys. You give us Snyder 2.0. Uh, defensively, I think that I, I'm kind of in a similar boat, but I think that I would actually lean more corner-wise 
just because I think that Casey, if they could lock up like one side of the field, it would really help this defense. So my pick, I'm not going to go Snyder 2.0 because, you know, that, you're that's going that. where you're going where I would go, I think, right here. Yeah, I'd go Terrence Newman as my <laughs> defender. That like yeah. if he if you could lock up one side of the field, I think that you're okay. And then offensively, I think Tyler Lockett is probably the answer, but like Jordy Nelson is another one that came to mind. And Kevin Lockett also came to my mind. But Tyler, I think with his route running and with Jace Brown's route running would be kind of nasty on the outside. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I yeah, Terrence Newman would have been the route that I would have gone defensively for the same reasons as Drew. But uh, if if we're talking like if these guys are getting another like another year or like kind of a do over, uh, I'd go Jordy Nelson just to give him that opportunity to not have to be weighed down by Ron <laughs> Prince. Uh, I think he'd probably have a lot more fun on this team than he did with with those teams. So, uh, yeah, I nobody wanted to say just bring Daniel Thomas back in there and have three running backs. <laughs> you know, go crazy on you. I, I would love to see uh, a team that had a running back situation like that and trying to figure out how to get all three of them uh, onto the, onto the field. Okay. Uh, let's close out Colorado talk real quick. Uh, Drew kind of got his word in, so I'll just let fan go here. Do you have anything to say to the Colorado fans, AKA really the Deion Sanders fans that came after you and everybody in the K-State world and still for some reason seem to continue coming after him, even though we have evidence that everything that was said before the game was correct. Look, I I tweeted the gif. I said what I said and it proved to be true. So I'll just I'll just stick with I said what I said. All right. Uh, let's move on. Talk a little West Virginia real quick uh, before we close out talking Big 12 and uh, get out of here on this Monday night. The Cats get ready to hit the road to Morgantown to see West Virginia. This will be the 12th meeting since the Mountaineers joined the Big 12 in 2012. Uh, K-State's won the last two meetings, both by 17 points, uh, 17 in Manhattan in 2021, 17 in 2022. And then they were one of the first teams that uh, kind of was odd to not see them on the schedule last year. So there's been a year gap between K-State seeing West Virginia. Uh, this game, 6.30 on Fox Saturday night. I noted down there, first seven games of the season have been on Fox or ESPN for e for K-State, which to me seems significant. They've got really good TV windows uh, throughout the season. Even if the late, late, late ones suck as a fan, I think they'll probably bear out rating-wise to be a good thing for K-State's exposure and, and the Big 12 at large. So uh, anybody want to take a first crack at breaking down the West Virginia game in, you know, three to five minutes. Yeah. I, you mentioned earlier um, the matchup with West Virginia's rush defense, which is pretty good. Um, uh, they would rank somewhere in the the top half of the big 12 in rush defense. Um, if I average out some of the advanced stats, I look at it probably be fourth or fifth in the league. Uh, very solid rush defense. You, 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 uh, put up the per game stats, which is top half as well. So um, that's going to be a challenge because K State's going to want to run the football. Now, on the other side of that, they probably have the worst pass defense. And you mentioned, I think you or Drew mentioned explosiveness given up. They rank 133 in the nation. And that's that might be almost last. Um, I can't remember how many of the Division I teams are on. I, I think, think there might be 136. 136. 135, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so they are near the bottom in explosiveness allowed with their pass defense is not very good. So that will be intriguing to watch how K-State attacks. Are they going to come out throwing like they did against Oklahoma State and throw it, you know, 55, 60 percent of the time in the first half and then go back to the run? Or are they just going to say, stop us, stop DJ, get stop our inside run game and see what happens. And then on the other end, their offense is solid. Um, I would put them. In the top half of the Big 12 in offense, probably sixth or seventh. Um, their rush offense and their pass offense are both around fifth or sixth in the league, averaging out the stats. So um, they, they provide a different challenge because they have a good running game. Uh, Jaheim Wright at running back, Garrett, uh, Garrett Green can run the ball a little bit. Decent throwing the ball. Um, you know, I, I think um, it's a little bit different situation because they're three and three, they're coming off a loss in what was a huge game for them. And that's one of those things where the timing might be good for K-State because can you really get yourself up for games back-to-back -back weeks, even though they're both home games, 
you know, you're trying to get yourself up for back-to-back games. They're basically identical games. Basically identical games. You're playing one of the top teams in the conference, trying to make that move up the, the league. Neil Brown is trying to get off uh, Mason's fraud list and, and, and not be at the bottom. So um, uh, this is a key game for them. But, you know, I think it's one of those games, if K-State can get off to a good start and get on them, I think it's a game where K-State could roll if – K-State lets West Virginia hang around, and it is still a game late in the third quarter, early in the fourth. And then we're going to go down, and it's going to be similar to the Colorado game. How concerning is the element of Garrett Green's running ability to you? A little bit. Just because we haven't seen a quarterback that really runs it a lot this year yet. Um, most of the guys, the teams we have seen, although, you know, BYU is hard to judge because Ratzleff is a runner. I mean, he runs quite a bit, but that was such a goofy game. It wasn't a game where that really came into play, per se. Um, so that he's he's the best running quarterback K State's seen this year, and I think Garrett Green's a little bit better. But Garrett Green has eight touchdowns and six interceptions throwing the ball. So um, it's one of those things where the approach is going to be way different in how K State attacks that offense. So <clears throat> there's a concern there, but I'm not overly worried about it because I think some of the other weaknesses make up for that. Yeah, I noted down there Garrett Green's fifth in the Big 12 in picks with six behind Noah Fafita, Alan Bowman, Jalen Daniels, and Isaac Wilson, four guys that have not really set the world on fire this season. Uh, Drew, what is your breakdown of the K-State-West Virginia game? Yeah, it's a totally like 300 or I guess 180 uh, I just tried to do a lot of math there that wasn't really going well. It's a total 180 and uh, how Casey will have to defend this game because West Virginia really has a three-headed monster running the ball. They're decent at throwing, but like not, I wouldn't say special uh, with how they throw the ball. Garrett Green does kind of like to throw the ball to the other team, though, so that's something to really kind of keep in mind. And, and this isn't really a breakdown about West Virginia. Uh like personnel wise, but the, the, the vibes at West Virginia are kind of weird right now after Neil Brown saying that he just wants the fans to have a good time win or lose and that they've played a tough schedule that that just kind of that comes across really weird and like a guy that might know that he's on the hot seat slash might know that he isn't going to win this week. And then uh, also, West Virginia best defensive lineman T.J. Jackson, who leads the Big Twelve in tackles for a loss, uh, was considered what is considered questionable at best going into this game, which is something important to note. And then Aubrey Burks, probably their best defensive back, is also considered probably questionable at best from uh, West Virginia's press conference today. So I think both of those things are very noteworthy, and just the vibes at West Virginia seem pretty down right now. Which uh, it's it's fascinating to say their best DB might be out when we've already talked about they may not have any good DBs uh, <laughs> based on their defense. Now, the other thing, too, this is a great point on Neil Brown by you, Drew, because if you look at West Virginia, the schedule has been tough. I mean, uh, Kellis tweeted out today it was kind of tongue in cheek, but there are three losses are to teams that are a combined 18 and 0 this season. And then they've taken care of business against Albany, Kansas, and Oklahoma State. So they're three and three, and they've lost the three teams that are unbeaten right now, beating everybody else. After K State, even though there are road games that will be coming, it's a manageable schedule based on how everything else is shook out in the Big 12. They're going to play at Arizona, at Cincinnati, Baylor at home, UCF at home, and then they close with Texas Tech. The, the comments by Neil Brown are extremely weird because this is a West Virginia team. Even if they lose this weekend, they're going to have a real chance to be seven and five, eight and four this season. Like that doesn't seem like this should not be the time to be going. Oh, you know, Hey, I just, I hope the fans are having fun, you know, blah, blah, blah. like the focus should be a little bit more refined. He was basically like pleading their fans to keep showing up, even though they're two and one in the big 12. It's just very strange to me. And, and yeah, it, it just feels like he thinks that he's about to get fired. It gives off a guy that, that knows something. And again, Ren Baker is a guy that he was not the athletic director that hired Neil Brown. Um, he came in and, and took over, I think it was two years ago. Uh, yeah, he was hired at the 
end of the 2022 football season, which was not a good time for Neil Brown when that season ended. And I'm thinking if things hadn't worked out schedule wise for West Virginia last year, Neil Brown probably isn't there this season. He got a second life. You start three and three, the writing might be on the wall. And this is one of those things where think back to Matt Wells situation in Mm -hmm. 2021 at Texas tech. I I don't know that it happens, but it would not be overly surprising that if K-State wins this game, if West Virginia doesn't just decide to act on the spot there and say, get him out of here before he wins a couple of games here, let's reset this thing and go from it now uh, because the West Virginia schedule does get pretty manageable. All right, uh, closing things out, talking Big 12. Here are the scores from week seven in the league. Obviously, West Virginia lost. We know what happened with K-State. Light slate all around Cincinnati UCF, ugly game teams that nobody cares about who cares but the two utah schools provided totally different results against the two arizona schools arizona state keeps some of their magic rolling with the 27 19 win over utah and may have ended the cam rising career because as we're recording this utah has come out and confirmed that cam rising is out for the rest of the season and then byu blasted arizona 41 to 19 uh so drew your biggest takeaway from those two Utah versus Arizona matchups? I think that my biggest takeaways are Arizona is probably the most disappointing team in the big 12. Like, well, outside of KU and Oklahoma state, they're probably third, but to not even really put up a fight against BYU is pretty tough. And and Noah Fafita has been really, really bad, especially these last two games. Like to the point where I tongue in cheek asked uh, while we were watching the BYU Arizona game in the hotel in Boulder or Denver, I said, "Like when when do we talk about Noah Fafita getting benched because he's well, been I, so bad?" I was going to ask you what what team overpays for him in the transfer portal this season because you know T Mac is going to leave for the NFL, <laughs> so he loses his best friend and really the reason why he stayed at Arizona. Uh, the, it seems like a situation where he may move on from here. Yeah, and that that totally wouldn't surprise me. And then Utah, until further notice, is just kind of a mess. Like, they would have been better off on Friday night playing Isaac Wilson, and instead they kept with Cam Rising when it was clear that he wasn't 100%, and and he just wasn't getting it done. And and I think that until something gets figured out at the quarterback position, Utah is kind of a a team that if they – if their defense allows probably that 14 to 17 points, they're probably going to lose. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to look at the most disappointing teams in the league. Um, And I think Arizona is in that conversation, Oklahoma state and KU just looking at average rankings and the metrics, all of them are about 30 spots worse than they were in the preseason where they were all ranked in the top 26 between 21 and 26, and now they're all ranked between 50 and 59 on average in the metrics. So disappointing teams, Arizona, probably at the top of that because they really haven't lost anybody major. They still have their two best players, and um, they're doing what they're doing. Uh, KU would be in that same boat. They really haven't lost anybody major and got supposedly their best quarterback back and have seemingly gotten worse. (laughs) Utah at least has an excuse. Yeah. of having Cam Rising being hurt. You know, and I will say, um, and I know you put it in the meaningless game, but Cincinnati is a team along with Arizona State, and I'd even still throw Colorado in there. Those three teams were all bottom four or five teams in the league and now are upper half teams through the midpoint of the season. Um, we'll see if they can keep that up. And then BYU using that boat as well. So we've seen almost a flip in the rankings. The only team that has managed to stay up there is us, really. Even Iowa State is 20 spots, 23 spots better in the rankings than they were in the preseason. The only team that has managed to stay where they're supposed to be is K State. And actually, we've even improved four spots compared to where we were in the preseason average rankings. So, um, it's it's been a bad year for the teams that were picked to be good in the Big Twelve, besides K State. So, hopefully, K State can keep that up and and not, you know, we have to play a couple more of those teams that weren't supposed to be good in Arizona State and Cincinnati, 
teams I thought would be very easy games at the beginning of the season are probably not going to be super easy games coming down the stretch. Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting because Kyle Whittingham at the beginning of the year, they they named a successor for him for whenever he hangs it up. He <laughs> said in 2027, he didn't think that he would be the head coach by then. You start to wonder with everything that's kind of going on if this ends up being the end of it for Kyle Whittingham. And it's kind of a weird way to go out and uh, a, a disappointing way for, for him and, and that fan base to kind of close things as well. All right, uh, here is a look at what we have on the docket for week eight in the Big 12. Um, obviously, some of those uh, – Colorado is not who K-State plays with 28 points. That's West Virginia again. But uh, of those games – I don't know how I missed changing the wording on that one. Of those games, though, uh, what's one or two that stand out to you as the most important ones in the weekend in the Big 12? Uh, fan, I'll let you lead off here. Well, for us um... – you, you kind of hope Mike Gunny can find some spark to, because we need BYU to, to lose. Um, twice. Twice. At least right now. But, you know, getting one loss would be nice. So that would be one to watch for. Um, and, you know, UCF is another team that's dropped off. I don't think they can, they have much chance to beat Iowa State. But this league has been so crazy. There's one or two games every weekend where you're like, what happened? How did that happen? And you never know who, what that's going to be. And then, you know, the two teams I mentioned, Arizona State and Cincinnati, play each other. So kind of a big game for those two teams to see who's going to be the team that stays on the rise. Uh, I'll be the sicko, and I'll say that my <laughs> game that I'm looking forward to the most is Houston going to Arrowhead to play KU. Uh, I'm not sure if it could get worse for KU, but losing to Houston I think would probably be close. And yeah. Houston, it, we were talking uh, before the yeah. press conference started today. That's a big game for Willie Fritz. Just like when H- when K State goes to Houston, that's going to be a big game for Willie Fritz too. And I think that it, if he can, he's going to try to pull out a lot of stops to try and beat KU. And I, I I'm very intrigued about what the crowd looks like at Arrowhead, and, and intrigued to see how KU looks post bye week. Uh, because again, vibes not great at KU either, and. Lance Leipold called Kobe Bryant highly questionable to play Saturday, which I don't know what that even means, really. Uh, But the other game that I'm probably looking forward to the most uh, probably has to be Arizona State going to Cincinnati. Uh, I was one of the people that really doubted Arizona State, uh, and they've really impressed me all year. And going across two different time zones to play at 11 a.m. at Cincinnati is going to be a tough game, and I... I'm really intrigued to see how they kind of respond to to that because there are there aren't many times where Arizona State's gonna have to play at eleven o'clock typically, and then play and then factor in going and playing at Eastern time uh, will just be really different. And I'm kind of intrigued to see how that all plays out because Cincinnati's another team that I kind of just left for dead and thought that they'd be just as yeah. bad as Arizona State. Uh, I had Arizona State Cincinnati on mine that I'm interested in. BYU Oklahoma State I'll be watching because it's Friday night. Nothing else will be going on. And uh, Oklahoma State might be able to pull a rabbit out of their hat. I don't know. We'll see. Mike Gundy got headbutted by a cow uh, this <laughs> this week apparently. So we'll see if that helps or hurts his cause. Uh, the other game this would go into the kind of the under the radar bucket because I don't know. You look at the schedule. There aren't a ton of g- overly fascinating games. Colorado Arizona might be because. I think Colorado is getting a lot of credit now for being – they are a legitimate top six team in the Big 12 right now, I think, based on the way things are going. But if they're that team, they have to go on the road and beat Arizona now because Arizona just got blasted by BYU, and Texas Tech won there two weeks ago. So you would think Colorado should go get the job done there. But really the other one that will be fascinated by the result, and I would maybe put them on upset watch, league leader Texas Tech right now because – Ever since Baylor went to Sawyer Robertson, they've showed a little more fight, and they competed with BYU at home, who's atop the league. They went on the road and took Colorado to the brink at Folsom Field, which K-State now knows was, is not an easy task. Um, I think Baylor might be a fascinating team here. Dave Veranda still is not a good coach. He's still in the basement <laughs> of Fraud Watch, but it is, to me, notable Um when talking about Baylor and, and I'll be interested to see what they look like against Texas tech. Cause they might be able to I, do something there. 
I, I do like calling for the upset in the butt bowl. I've been looking at that one as well. Uh, yeah. The other, the other upset that I'll I'll throw out is the other game that you talked about. I'll I'll take Colorado over Arizona. All right, uh, all right. Let's finish it off. Fraud watch time. As a reminder for the people out there, this is what week six looked like in fraud watch. We had five studs, three in no man's land, four in the watch, three under an advisory, and three in a warning. Now you notice a couple of guys, they were, they were on there twice. Mike Gundy, Kyle Whittingham, lifelong studs, but this season they got issues. Um, we'll see where they go this weekend. Some other guys, a lot of movement this week. Some people thought, ah, oh, there were only five games. There can't be that much that went on. No, there's a lot that happened. Think there's a giant valley in fraud watch now with two giant mountains on both sides of that valley here is the week seven fraud watch look at the movement there <laughs> ladies and gentlemen look at it got a bunch of guys that have a fraud advisory waving for them now keep in mind brent brennan that's a that's a big dangerous move but uh chris Kleiman, mike gundy kyle whittingham kenny dillingham and matt campbell welcome kalani sataki to the big kids table because that is a stud right there. I, I kept wanting to doubt him and doubt BYU. And again, I will say that the season doesn't really start until you have to go on the road against a, an opponent in the Big 12 that isn't Baylor, KU, or Houston. But they're off to a good start. They're hard to deny right now. And a 41-19 to 19 win over Arizona deserves a lot of respect. So he is in the stud category. Scott Satterfield, Willie Fritz, bad team. No one cares. I not going to pay attention to you. Not much could be done unless Scott Satterfield goes nine and three this season, which he's trending in that direction. And then is, is this, is this not a legacy game for Willie Fritz this week? Um, no, he's, they're just so bad. I, I can't justify, but we'll they see. Would how have two big, they'd have two big 12 wins. That's more than I think we all, we all anticipated. Uh, not me. You know, I had a soft spot for the teams that everybody kind of crapped on in the preseason. Um, I, I think Willie Fritz is a good coach, but if he does it, we'll talk. We'll see how this, this goes. Joey McGuire still firmly in watch. I see right through that record that they're tossing out there right now. Great. Who cares? We go out and beat somebody. Uh, don't lose to Baylor this weekend. Advisory still Mike Gundy. If he doesn't get a real quarterback, seems like that won't happen this year. Uh, I think Alan Bowman's still going to get rolled out this week. And then Neil Brown, it, it's gotten even more iffy for him. Deion Sanders still there. He's got room to move up, um, but he's going to have a lot to overcome just because I don't know how long term he is at Colorado. And you're kind of a fraud if you're just there to dip out the second your kid and Travis Hunter leave the program. So Deion Sanders is a long term watch. Um, he might get the bump up, though. Gus Malzahn, you keep slipping. My goodness. Uh <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the same story as Auburn. He could recruit at Auburn, but then couldn't really do anything. They got tired of him. I, you know, credit to Auburn. They actually saw through on that one, even though they fire every coach they ever have. Uh, Brent Brennan keeps slipping on down. Guy just looks lost on the sidelines. I get that it's it's for a good reason. It does not help that he has a giant piece of shrubbery around his neck. I just And he always has this look on his face that's like, I don't know, dumbfounded and uh, it's 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 a weird look. Um, so there was some tweet or, or post a couple of weeks ago that I thought summed up the Brent Brennan look uh, perfectly. He he looks a little lost out there right now. This might be a, a level or two above what he should be accomplishing. Uh, meanwhile, I think San Jose State's having an okay season. And another thing that you can't trust with Brent Brennan, he's apparently 51 years old. He looks older than 51 <laughs> years old. So. <laughs> Which is odd because you think about good coaches recently in college football or basketball and you look at him and you go, wow, that guy's 75. I would have guessed at least like 68, but not 75 or 80. What, what are we doing here? Uh, if you're looking older than you actually are, not a good sign in this profession. So Brent Brennan down in the advisory, and then Dave Aranda, Sonny Dykes, fraud warning. This is their division, uh, but they have company. We talked about Lance Leipold when he doesn't take accountability. We'll see if that happens uh, throughout this week or against Houston. And then Kyle Whittingham, if he doesn't get a real quarterback, and this is just sad turn of events for Kyle Whittingham. Uh, again, lifelong stud like Mike Gundy, they will not be dropped from that category ever, but, we might be getting close to that time where it's, you know, you call the family in and you say, we need to have a real conversation about the quality of life here. 
And uh, I don't know that there's great quality of life for the Utah football program the rest of the season. So that is your Big 12 Week 7 fraud watch to close things out. Any comments or concerns about the coaches listed here? Uh, I I like having Brennan in an advisory. That was going to be probably where I, I would have requested to put him. Uh, I would have also put Mike Gundy probably in the warning if he doesn't get a real quarterback because they are probably – worse than utah still yeah uh other than that um neil brown watch <laughs> out buddy <laughs> if you don't if you don't beat k yeah. this week uh yeah. and then gus gus malls on i i'm gonna th- i think that there might be two two other dudes in the warning category after the end of this weekend yeah it's a good point it's a very good point yeah i, I agree it's a brennan take like Arizona fans are not happy from what I can see on Twitter with what's going on there. Um, and I do like the Sataki move to the said category. He's definitely earned it. Um, you know, and they, it wasn't quite the same, but the way they beat Arizona was a flurry of turnovers and points and craziness for, it wasn't quite as bad a stretch as ours, but yeah, it was, it was a little similar. bit more because Arizona kind of did that more to themselves than, a little K State's was a little bit more bad yeah. luck than the average. Oh, we committed a bunch of mistakes, but that that's impressive. And then you know Joey McGuire's. I, I'd say I agree with the, the the Baylor game being a pretty pivotal game for him. Yeah, uh, this is my point about Brent Brennan too. At San Jose State, he was there for seven seasons. Yeah, he won he won his conference title twice. He did it in his last year there. They went seven and six, so they were. They were one and three in non-conference play that year, and then also lost the Hawaii Bowl. Um, they lost that game last season to Coastal Carolina, who wasn't very good last year. Um, the only year that he had more than two games of separation between his win and loss total, at least in the positive, he went seven and one in the COVID season, and he went seven and zero oh in the COVID Mountain West. Uh, and then lost in the Arizona Bowl by 21 to Ball State. And if anybody knows me and my opinion of the COVID season, it's that <laughs> nothing that happened there is real. It it counts, and you get credit for it. You can have your trophies. You can have your wins. But it does not mean anything long-term for your individual self or the program. And we have numerous examples of that Mm -hmm. the los angeles dodgers have not won a world series outside of the covid year the los angeles lakers have not won uh, an nba finals outside of the covid year in the current construction of their organization wichita state fired greg marshall less than a month before the season started and won a conference with houston who went to the final four that season and then they were terrible the years after that and i can keep iowa state won the fiesta bowl I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Uh, that's going to get clipped, Mason. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, I've I've talked with Plain Blazovic from uh, uh, Cyclone Alert, uh, where my good friend Alec Bussey works, about this. We had a conversation about this last year before the K State Iowa State basketball game, and he was kind of pushing back on it. And then when I made the point about LeBron and the Lakers, he was like, ah, "Actually, you know what? I might be on your side with that now." So. <laughs> That would be the concerning thing for me is uh, it was kind of a confusing hire at the time because Mm -hmm. it didn't make sense on what Brent Brennan did to get this job other than the fact that Arizona made this move as an attempt to make sure that Noah Fafita and Ted Rowe McMillan and a bunch of their other guys of Samoan descent did not enter the transfer portal and leave the program because that's the one area where Brent Brennan has really good ties, lots of connection. That's why he wears the lay around his neck. That would be the thing. And ultimately for this, the health of your program, I'm not sure that's the best way to make decisions as an athletic director is to say, we're making this higher to save this one season or a couple, as opposed to the long-term success of the program. And uh, I'd be very concerned if I'm an Arizona fan right now because you're not going to have more talent than what you have this season, I think, for years to come. 
And if you're achieving at this level, it means bad things. I, there's probably a real scenario where I don't know buyout stuff, but if we're just talking about college football money and how it gets used, Brent Brennan probably should not be the head coach after next season at Arizona based on the way things are trending. So that would be uh, my take. And that's what fraud watch looks like this week. So went a little longer than I anticipated, but a lot of good stuff rounding out the Colorado game, K-State getting ready for West Virginia. We'll talk about the Cats and the Mountaineers throughout the rest of the week uh, and also the build up to that and then get ready for next week where we're going to get a little bit more basketball content. We'll talk Big 12 Basketball Media Days next Wednesday when we're there in Kansas City. So for Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show. Back again tomorrow to talk more Cats right here on the KSO YouTube.